Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. For the rest of December, we're going to, well, at least until Christmas, uh, we're having a three-week sermon series called Game Plan. Now, it's uh, basketball season, but we're not having our basketball games this winter at Grace. We're we're still having some practices in hopes of a spring season, but hosting games with other teams and rafts and fans doesn't even doesn't make sense even to a sports not like me right now. Um, but since I'm so used to game planning at this time of year, I decided since I can't, can't game plan for basketball, I'm going to game plan for church. So we're making it into a sermon series. It's, I'm getting my fix of game planning, if nothing else. And after all, Advent is really about getting ready for the return of our king. And not only the, our king coming to us at Christmas, but also we're getting ready for our king to return to us, uh, uh, his ultimate return, which is really what our gospel, our epistle readings are about the next several weeks. Um, now, before you make any kind of game plan, you really have to know who's on your team. For instance, if you have talented big guys who can dribble, pass, and shoot, well, you probably are going to run a lot of your offense through them. On the other hand, if you've got three-point sharpshooters, then you probably believe in the three, and you want to make sure you get lots of those. If you want if you want to pressure the ball on defense, well, you better make sure you have some quick, athletic, and aggressive guards. The point is, who you have on your team will help determine what you're going to do. It would be foolish to forget about the best player on your team. If you have someone like LeBron or Steph Curry or James Harden on your team, well, it would be foolish not to run your offense through them. If so, too, our life, our game plan, really needs to include Jesus and his instructions and make them central or the center of our game plan. Well, Peter assures us that God has an exciting game plan. He, he knows what's out there, and he has a plan for it. One day, the Lord will return, and when he does, he will come in power and glory. He will come when we least expect him, and the heavens will pass away in a roar, and heavenly bodies will be dissolved. And on that day, everything that has been done on earth will come to light and be judged, Peter says. The old heavens and the old earth will be replaced by a new heavens and a new earth. Now, there's a lot of kind of intimidating language uh, or dramatic language about the earth being melted. And here's the way I would think of it. Um, like a, a holiday baker melting down chocolate to make something even more delicious, well, that's kind of what Peter is describing. He's melting down the elements of this world, and he's going to reform it into something spectacular, uh, something even greater, the new heavens and the new earth. But that, of course, means that this world is temporary. And we also learn and are reminded of from Peter that the light will expose the darkness, wickedness will be overthrown, and righteousness established forever. So what does Peter tell us since we know the game plan? He says, you guys know what's going to happen. The wicked will not prosper, not eternally anyway. You know that God wins and goodness will endure. So how do you think you ought to live? If you want to play any game, it's better to know kind of the rules of the game. If you know the rules of basketball, uh, you're going to do better in the game. So too, as Christians, we know the rules of life. We know how life is supposed to be lived, lived and what the rules are. We, so therefore, we want to stick with what will endure, goodness, mercy, treating God and our neighbor in the right sort of way. We might as well, you might say, start practicing for eternity because that's how we're going to be living in eternity. Might as well get used to it now. And not only is good better than evil, but good outlasts evil. It's eternal, which when we think about it, it's very good news because right, you don't really want 
nasty and evil things to keep on going. You want them to come to an end. You see something that is wrong, you want it to stop, right? Um, and that's what part of God's game plan is. Now, the process and the journey there is both awesome and frightening, but remember, we know what the end result is, and so that's what we're all pining for this Christmas. Um, what Peter is describing, kind of the, the phrase I use for my sermon uh, title is patiently aggressive. That's a, a phrase that some basketball coaches use, which it's kind of a head scratcher at first, but I think it really makes a lot of sense when you break it down. It means to be, you have to be aggressive. Let's say in basketball, you really need to be aggressive, looking to get a good shot, but you also have to be patient. You have to be patient enough to wait for the right shot. It can probably apply in all kinds of things. Um, but in particular, talking about basketball, you just can't be passive. If you're just standing there on offense, you're not doing your team a lick of good, right? Or if you're just standing there on defense, you're probably not doing your team much good either. You've got to be active. It is a game of movement. So even if you're not the great world's greatest shooter, you still got to make your presence felt by setting a pick or fighting for a rebound or cutting to the hoop or making your presence known in one way or the other. On the other hand, even a really good offensive player can get themselves into a lot of trouble if they just have it set in their mind that they are going to shoot no matter what. And aggressive is different than out of control. And that's true in basketball as well as life. It's, in basketball, it's really wonderful if you have the ability to go get your own shot. But having tunnel vision and saying, I'm going to shoot no matter what happens, well, that leads to turnovers and wasted possessions. And as a coach, I see that a lot with you know, the, the age of players that I'm working with. I see a lot of young players. Maybe they're, they're pretty good, some of them, and uh, they have a good shot, let's say. But the problem is they feel like they've got to do it all by themselves. Now, as a coach, when a player is fearless and confident, that's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing. You want someone who's confident, who's not afraid. Um, but you've also got to use your brain and exercise your patience muscle and, and understand the game as well. With a talented play, player, let's say someone is a good player, what they have to learn is that they don't have to or shouldn't just settle for any shot. But rather, if they work for it, if they wait for the play to develop, if they're patient, they can get a good shot, a better shot than just chucking it up as soon as they come up the court. Well, that's the same for Christians in our life, too. We want to be aggressive about doing God's work, but we also need to be patient to wait for God's timing as well. Knowing that God wants us to do good things, he's got he wants us to do he doing positive things, but sometimes we have to wait for the right timing. And Peter wants Christians to be patiently aggressive. Uh, on the one hand, like I said, we have to wait for God's plans to take shape. Sometimes you can't rush them along. But at the same time, we need to be actively living lives of holiness. Now, right? think about who's writing this. This is Peter. And this totally makes sense for something that Peter would say. I mean, if Peter were a basketball player, what kind of basketball player would he be? He would have been a guy with no fear, with a lot of confidence and a, a quick trigger finger, right? Peter was naturally aggressive. Right? What he had to learn was the patient part, which he did. Uh, the Lord had to hit him over the head a couple times, but Peter eventually learned. He was rebuked. Remember, he told Jesus, no, 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 we're not doing that cross thing, right? God, but Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And uh, there's other opportunities. But Peter had to learn to wait for God's plan. He had to learn that impatience uh, wasn't always the answer, that sometimes you had to wait uh, and rely on God and uh, look at the cross and the empty grave and wait for God's plan to take shape. So Peter reminds us, again, I think sometimes you're better at teaching something when you've made the mistakes, and Peter has made the mistake of being impatient, so he's maybe a better teacher of how to be patient. He reminds us that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, 
and a thousand years is as a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. In other words, God's not slow or inept or oblivious to what's going on. Rather, God's got perfect timing. Again, back to sports, good basketball players or, or wrestlers or football players, they know when to stop and they know when to go. And sometimes, you know, when you, in basketball, you have maybe you have a little hesitation dribble, you act like you're going slow, and then all of a sudden you quickly speed up, you get the defense on their heels and take advantage of them. Um, well, so too God knows what he's doing. He knows the right time to stop and he knows the right time to go, even if we think he should be going when he's stopping or stopping when he's going. God knows how to set the play up uh, because um, when Jesus returns, it will be like a, a monster dunk, a posterization uh, of the devil. And so, uh, therefore, until that time, we are called to be ready because we don't know, right? We don't know when he's coming back, just that he will. And, and again, this makes a lot of sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Uh, why is God, why don't we know? Why doesn't God tell us? Well, it's kind of like an, an explosive athlete. You just don't know in basketball. You don't know when they're going to explode towards the hoop. Um, and, and, and that unpredictability and that explosive na part nature is part of what keeps his opponents on their toes and in constant doubt and fear of what he will do next. If you're a, a good sports player and you study film, a lot of times you might know uh, in this situation, or if this guy looks like this, sometimes a, a player will make a mistake or somebody else will do something good and you can just kind of see it in their eyes that they're going to take the ball and they're going to get a shot. You just, you know, I mean, at least I, you, know, you play enough, you start to get this, oh, this guy, he's mad. He's going to try to do something. And then it's a lot easier to prepare because you know what, you know, we, don't worry about the pass. He ain't looking to pass. He's going to shoot it, right? So you just got to stay in front of him and, and you know, and maybe you double team him because he's going to do, he's going to shoot no matter what. Well, God is not, you can't, God has a good poker face. You can't predict when he's going to come back or what he's going to do next. And that, uh, if that's an opponent of yours, thinking from uh, evil's perspective or the devil's perspective, that is really hard to deal with. You don't know when they're going to go this way or when they're going to go that way. And that's, I think, part of why God hasn't revealed uh, so that the powers of this world and the powers of darkness don't know what God's going to do next. Um, so uh, we know that when he does move, it'll be the right move at the right time, and he's going to strike a, a fatal blow to death and he'll put some nasty moves on the evil one. So once again, knowing that goodness wins um, and that uh, we will make every effort, therefore, to live at peace with God and to be holy uh, because we can wait for the Lord because when he moves, it will be uh, a, a devastating to, to evil move. And Peter wants us to be holy. Now, Peter uses the phrase holy a lot. I think in common conversations, we don't use the word holy quite so much anymore. And, and unfortunately, it kind of has some negative, sometimes it has good connotations, but sometimes it has negative connotations. But perhaps if we consider Peter again as, as a coach, maybe a, a gritty basketball coach constantly urging his players to just do the fundamentals, right? Coaching is, and basketball and every sport, so much of it is really just getting back to the fundamentals and carrying out, doing the fundamentals the right way. There's all kinds of fancy stuff, and you need some of it, but really a lot of it is, can you do the basics? Can you be disciplined enough to do the basic things that you need uh, to do? And that's kind of what Peter's telling us, and part of the Christian life is really about discipline. It's not always about something new, but it's simply about sticking to what we know is the right thing to do, which to Peter would be simply called Holiness, stick into the fundamentals, loving the Lord your God, being faithful, listening to his word. Those are the fundamentals that Peter is constantly urging us to remember. Now, when Peter talks about um, 
about living lives as holy, uh, he's not talking about being wimp or being passive, right? I mean, those are really not words that most of the time you would use to describe Peter, right? Maybe hot-headed, out of control at times, um, aggressive, strong. Uh, those are the kinds of things. And that's what Peter wants out of us. He means be active. It's not just, and this is part of what's wrong with holiness. Sometimes people think holiness means simply not doing something that's a no-no. But holiness is more than just avoiding certain things. It's doing, it's actively doing good. Not just, it means, for instance, not just feeling bad for people who are lonely, but calling them up or sending them a card. It means not just agreeing that the world is a problem, but taking active steps to fix the problem and to help the hurting. It means modeling the right and healthy way to live and to interact with others and being a witness by our actions in the way uh, in our own patience. It's not weak, but in, in the opposite, it actually requires a lot of discipline and self-denial in pursuit of something greater, uh, God's coming kingdom and salvation through Christ. And that is exactly what God calls us to as part of His team. We, encur we are encouraged to be patient in the midst of trials because the Lord has a good plan, a, a great one. A lot of times when you're playing a game or you're a part of a team, it, you want to know that there's a plan. And sometimes when there's not a plan, you can tell, and it's frustrating to, to players. But when you have a plan uh, that and say, look, we know we have a plan for this. We know what's going to happen. Um, that's part of a coach's job, too, is to say, here, we're losing. This happens. Here's what we need to do. Um, and God has that game plan for us. He knows what's going on. He's going to take care of us. And for our part, the little things that we need to do, our part of the plan to carry out is to be searching for opportunities here on earth to do good, uh, to be faithful to Christ, and to share the good news. Um, so we uh, want to be both patient as we wait for the Lord, but aggressive to do good and to pursue his kingdom. Uh, be patiently aggressive. In Jesus' name, amen.